let's turn to more practical issues of acquired resistance. Uh, if we live in a world where whether it's by trials or actual FDA approved drug, are you going to be inclined to switch to a second generation ALK inhibitor or, or another trial, HEAT protein inhibitor for instance, in somebody with the first evidence of even relatively mild progression, and I'll ask that in both systemically or extracranially outside the brain as well as within the brain if they're on Zalcori at the time. Uh, and, and you guys have a wide range of trials, so maybe I'll start you there. If you, you know, are you inclined to just move on, or do you sometimes, are you inclined to stay on the same drug and reserve something else in, on the back burner? Well, I mean, I think it's a very um, sort of individual, individual question. So on a case-to-case -case basis, you kind of have to assess this. Um, Certainly, what we have typically done for patients who might relapse in the brain, for example, with one small or a couple small asymptomatic brain lesions is to use radiation, usually focused radiation, the gamma knife or the stereotactic radiosurgery to treat those lesions. And if there's really continued systemic control, meaning the rest of the disease in the body is under control, then we tend to continue on to Zalcori. Over the years, though, now that we have more and more of these second-generation ALK inhibitors um, that are showing activity in the brain, I have to say my threshold for switching patients to a second generation is a little bit lower now. Mm -hmm. um, in part, it gets to Jack's point about um, you would hate to miss an opportunity to switch somebody. So you can imagine someone might appear to have very stable disease, you're following them, and then it's possible they could have more rapid progression of disease and this could prevent them from ever seeing that second or third generation ALK inhibitor. So my threshold is a little, little bit lower, but I th feel it's kind of hard to sort of set a rule. It's very much um, based on, on the individual patient. Well, that in itself says something that it's, you know, it's not like everybody gets a switch at the first right. opportunity. That's true. And, and Ross, you Excuse me, but how do you, if someone is completely controlled below the neck and they've had two or three treatments, and they're on Zalcori a long period of time. How do you move them to a trial if they don't have measurable disease below the neck? Well, <clears throat> oftentimes they do have measurable disease, so that's, that will help, but you're right. Um, for many trials, they do require measurable disease in the body. Currently, uh, LDK, which is on expanded access um, prior to approval, does not require measurable disease, so I have, have cases like exactly what you're saying where there's progression in the brain the systemic disease is, con is controlled, but the, we can't control the brain disease now, but they've already had radiation or, or whatever, and does, those patients I've moved to LDK because I've been able to access it in that situation. Um, again, once, once we have more drugs available commercially, then that will be less, less of an issue in terms of the measurable disease. Ross, and you, your institution has done some of this work on continuing beyond progression, so how do you think about it now with other options available? So, you have to play the long game, and you know you're going to need the plan B and the plan C. So my policy is to try and stretch, you know, the other analogy is a kind of, you know, patchwork quilt. So you want each bit of the patches to be as big as possible and get as much benefit out of it. So if there's one deposit in the bone which is progressing and everything else is controlled, I have really very little hesitation to zap that with radiotherapy and keep the crizotinib going. And the same with an isolated deposit in the brain. Now, the tipping point, as Alice says, particularly with the brain, is if somebody starts to say, okay, well, we need to go to whole brain radiotherapy, which I'm not a big fan of, then I would absolutely switch to a second generation inhibitor. Because singly the worst, so I, I want to talk a little bit about whole brain radiotherapy. So whole brain radiotherapy originated in the days when people didn't live long enough to get side effects. It's as simple as that. And now we're keeping people alive for years. They are living long enough to manifest the damage to the brain that that radiation does. And it, some of the biggest tragedies is when you have somebody whose disease is perfectly controlled and they're starting to essentially dement. And it's very sad when it happens. So I, I will always try and favor stereotactic radiosurgery in the brain. If there's too many, I'll go to the second generation drugs. I want to pick up on your point about entry into a study if you're just progressing in the brain. And it's, it's been you know, an amazing journey for, for several of us around this table over the last few years, just about the number of knock-on effects that have happened you know, by being involved with crizotinib and ALK. And one of them is changing the way we do clinical trials, not just about molecularly pre-selecting patients, 
but the whole idea of the brain as a relevant endpoint. You know, so um, Alice had mentioned that crizotinib has got some activity on the brain, but we've had to work very hard to actually pull that data out of the study because it's not very well captured. The other is having studies which are blanketly written that says if you have progression in your brain, you don't qualify. So now, fortunately, some of those studies are actually saying, well, we, we want a cohort of people who are just progressing in the brain, because that's an interesting question. So we're kind of, the door isn't quite open, but we have to keep pushing on it to say, this is a real medical problem, I exist, and you need to have a trial for me.